First of all, I'd like to introduce Chris Gandhi, Frank Gandhi, That's right. and uh, he's hosting tonight, so he's just going to say a few words for Shepard Bowen. Hi everyone, how are you? Can you hear me okay? I, actually, I started out life as a litigator, so I have a booming voice, so it's, it's my wife I thought I'd use it at life. So I recently joined here, but I've been doing campus uh, for several years. I, I'm an FDA regulatory lawyer, and I think a lot of the exciting stuff in campus now is FDA in terms of edibles, vaping, I'm doing some cutting edge research. I have a new vaping client I got today. I have a food certifier that I'm hoping to sign up tomorrow. Someone is a, a water bottler and had a question about cannabis on, on bottling water. So it's a really interesting, fast paced field. And we lawyers are just catching up to all the exciting things you're doing. So here at Shepherd Mullen, we have over 90 attorneys on our cannabis team. I think we're one of the major firms just to come out and say, hey, we're doing it. And I think there are many paths. I don't think everything's illegal, even on the federal level. I think there's a lot of legality out there already, and I've been advising clients on that. So um, I'm very excited to be uh, up here. And uh, you know, we have tax and corporate. We're full service now in this field. Thank you. Um, so uh, Yasmin Pasifar is actually going to moderate tonight. She's also works for Shepard Mullen and uh, knows his industry. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Yasmin. Great, thank you. Um, yes, I am in the Intellectual Property Practice Group and I'm also on the Canvas Industry Team. So if you have any IP questions, trademark, patents, trade secrets, anything, we can talk after this. Okay, um, so the first thing I want to do today is to have each one of you introduce yourself and give us a couple lines about your company. So we'll start with Erin. Sure, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Erin Gore. I am the founder and CEO of Garden Society. We're a lifestyle cannabis operator here in California. We're in B Corp for products and education for women. Um, we've been around since 2016, so we've kind of crossed the Prop 215 to Prop 64 threshold, if you will, um, and now we're in uh, high growth mode. So um, a little bit about my background. I'm a chemi. I come from corporate CPG. I had a 10 and a half year career there. My husband and I have a joint venture with Constellation Brands, where we launched a 165,000 case wine brand. So I see the alcohol bev space, I see CPG, and I'm really excited to, at the end of the day, make women feel good. Because I started this company because I kept turning to weed to help me sleep, help me find joy, help me find balance, all the things that I was desperately searching for. And so um, I'm excited to be on this panel and honored, and I look forward to the conversation. Hi, I'm Jamie Pearson. I am the COO of Bang Corporation. Bang's one of the OG cannabis brands. We've been around since 2010. Uh, so we're getting ready to enter into our 10th year this coming August. Um, we started with a gourmet line of chocolate bars. Our CEO is a master chocolatier and a, um, a chef. Um, chef de cuisine and James Beard rated Michelin star chef. So he approached cannabis from the CPG space as well because he'd been putting chocolate in Whole Foods and Dina DeLuca for many, many years before he started infusing our chocolate bars with cannabis. Now we are a global house of brands. We went public two weeks ago on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the trading symbol BHNG. Um, we are right now selling a little over 100 SKUs of cannabis, CBD, and terpene products globally. We are in seven states, getting ready to expand into three more, just right at the finish line with those contracts. We're in nine foreign countries, getting ready to expand into three more. Um, and at the end of the day, we see cannabis as a CBG play as well. Um, Bang's a great company to work for, and we've got 90% uh, female executive team. And it's, it's really an honor to, to work for Bang. One of the other projects we do and then how I got involved with Bang is I came out of uh, the real estate industry. I was a real estate executive. I owned an investment firm. I did real estate for 20 years. And I still own my investment company. I'm a property management company. Um, and I was an investor for DJ Monks of Cypress Hill. And he came to me and said, Cypress Hill's ready to do a weed brand. Um, you know, Be Real had one, Sen was, was forming one, but Muggs wanted one for Cyprus and came to me and said, you know I'm going to make you read all these contracts anyway, so why don't you just go find us a weed brand? And that's how I found Bang. We did a deal with Cypress Hill, and the rest is history. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Oh, yeah, that one. Okay, um, I'm the sure. legit um, artist. Mm -hmm. I got a, um, <laughs> so I own the Hip Hop Station in Vallejo, California, which is a cannabis club, and I um, also have my own brand online, own blunts called Be The Blunts and Cannabis. And uh, I'm, I'm just on the ground level. I'm, I'm not like these guys yet, but I plan on being. Hello, my name is Isaac Dietrich. I'm the founder and CEO of Mass Roots. We're one of the largest technology platforms for the cannabis industry with 1.2 million users. It's kind of like a Yelp for cannabis or an Instagram for cannabis, um, where we enable people to rate and review strains and products, not providing medical advice, all community <laughs> driven. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it allows consumers to learn about which strains and which products work best for the situation that they're, they're looking to alleviate or, um, or how they're looking to feel. Um, where we see the most opportunity right now is in consumer rewards. So we launched a rewards program called We Pass, kind of like an airline's rewards miles or hotel rewards points for the cannabis industry. And we feel that this is going to be the best way to create recurring consumer loyalty um, and really take advantage of an unserved uh, need and unserved uh, market in the cannabis industry today. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was your business model. And specifically, um, Aaron, if you could tell us how did you determine like who your customers were and how do you reach them? We would love to hear about your home parties. Sure. So my customer is me. <laughs> um, we started out of self me. Like I said, I had um, I started using edibles in 2012. I had both my hips rebuilt from old college athlete injuries. I'm in the aging athlete program now at Stanford Medicine. And so um, I kept turning back to cannabis to manage my chronic pain, my recovery, sleeping. And in 2014, while I was managing this hundred million dollar business, and my husband and I launched our wine brand. I kept turning back to cannabis because I was having miscarriages, I wasn't happy, I kept turning back to cannabis, I kept turning back to cannabis. And I started these things called high holiday baking parties where um, my girlfriends and I would get together and make edibles in my kitchen. And it started with three of us, so I had a gourmet chef girlfriend, um, she was a private chef in, in Healdsburg, I live in Sonoma County. Um, I knew the stoichiometry, the chemistry of how to dose it properly. So it started with three of us, grew to 56 of us within a matter of months. And what I realized was two things. One, I wasn't alone in my search for happiness and my struggles, because I felt so alone and so ashamed before that. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God. And then two, all these women wanted to talk about cannabis. They wouldn't have got together if they didn't want to talk about cannabis. It wasn't to talk about our problems. And that was the moment that parlayed me into quitting and really building Garden Society. So who that consumer is, we have her, we know her. It's not literally me, but it is me. <laughs> but we talk about these women, 35 plus, the women who's really underserved in the traditional market today. And then we started a model because we realized through guerrilla marketing efforts, literally standing in front of dispensaries, clocking how many of our target consumers walk in, we realized it weren't going into the dispensaries today because there's a cannabis desert in the regulated landscape of Prop 64. There's a choke in the retail footprint. And so communities like um, San Mateo, like Santa Barbara, Walnut Creek, Healdsburg, Napa, like all the communities that you know that kind of epitomize California don't have cannabis regulated commercial business. And so we realized through in-home parties that we can actually access our target consumer and we can scale that out Women buy based on, 70% of women buy based on their friend's recommendation, 70%. So if we do an in-home party model like Stella and Dot, like Beauty Counter, like Mary Kay, Tupperware, we actually create fun, we create joy, we get women educated, which is core to our mission, we answer their questions, we build trust, and we turn it into revenue. And then we can scale them into the dispensary. So we service both current dispensaries and then our target consumer through this innovative channel. Awesome. So for those who are interested, how do they go about signing up for your home party? Yeah, so if you go on our website, society.com, you can actually just send us your information on the site. There's a there's a form, contact us form for the parties. Um, we are currently expanding the program, so we're looking for gardeners, we call them, which are party educators, and we're looking for hosts. So whether if you want to host a party with your friends, if you want to just 
attend the party and see what it's all about. If you want to actually work for us and become one of these party gardeners, where your job is to really educate this consumer base, we are looking at all three of them as we're currently building it out and expanding statewide. Okay, so can you like show up to a random person's party or do you... Well, we cultivate it. We cultivate it. So women really want to have it with their friends, yeah. but we'll say, oh, there's a party in Napa right now. Do you mind if we invite these three women who are looking to come to a party? So it's very curated because that way it's very comfortable, right? right. Like nobody wants random people in their home. No, I mean, we, nobody wants that. I've been there. Um, <laughs> especially smoking weed, nobody wants that. Um, but we curate it, and most of these women, you know, they trust us, they know us, so everybody's really open, and we've been able to build our network. And then the interesting thing is we actually get, the business side of you, we get 85% conversion at the party. So people actually buy there, we get 73% reorder rate, and then we run a last mile direct to consumer, so you can buy on our website, we can deliver it to your house directly. You never have to touch foot in a dispensary. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so Isaac, you previewed your rewards program for us, so if you could tell us a little bit more about your business model and why you decided to implement the rewards program and, and, and your results from your beta testing, if you are willing to share them. Sure. So one of the greatest problems that is facing brands and dispensaries in the space right now is traceability and trackability in terms of their advertising. So all brands now in the in the space, most of the major brands are turning more into the, you know, measuring everything by data and, and measuring the exact ROI. Um, and that's what our rewards program provides to them. Um, they're able to tell exactly how many sales, how many new customers, how many recurring customers, exactly how much those customers spent on their products um, based on their, their spend on advertising. Um, and that's, quite frankly, not been done yet in the cannabis industry. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer for any other industry. That's what most marketers expect, is to be able to measure and track their ROI on their spend. Um, but this is, I think, going to be one of the first programs in the space that enables them to do that. Um, but more importantly for consumers, all consumers love earning free stuff, free points, uh, free products. Um, so it's kind of a no-brainer for the consumers. If you want to earn free stuff, then use our program over, other, uh, over the other apps and other programs on the market today. Um, so we uh, completed a beta test a couple weeks ago. Um, we're revising the docs, obviously, with our expert attorneys at Shepard Mullen, making sure it's in complete <laughs> compliance with all the state regulations. Um, and it's going to be rolled out later this summer in a form that we believe can be transformative to the entire cannabis industry, not just here in California, but in multiple states across the country. So keep your eyes posted. It's going to be, going to be very fun. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Jamie, I wanted to ask you about being a multi-state operator. You mentioned that you were, you guys um, operated in nine different countries. So if you could tell us a little bit about how many states and foreign countries that you operated in and what it's like to be operating in different countries. Well, first I want to say that every time somebody speaks on the panel, I want to just stop for a second and talk to them. Um, yeah, so Bangs, um, we went multi-state in 2012 um, because we realized that with federal um, prohibition, the only way that you can actually expand your footprint is to open through licensing mm -hmm. um, in multiple states. So we really had a vision of being a CPG company and eventually potentially being an M&A target. Uh, for, a, for a Procter & Gamble or a Hershey's or somebody down the road, um, not really ever knowing how long it was going to take for, um, for Schedule 1 to go away or for cannabis to be federally legalized. And you just kind of bob and weave. You know, every year we're, we're dodging some new bullet or we're trying to figure out banking or credit card processing or whatever it is. So the challenges of being a multi-state operator are there are many, and one of them that, that are really obvious is that you have to figure out every state has different rules. So, for example, 
when we were in New York, which we're no longer in New York. It just became commercially um, non-viable. But we were with the Etain company in New York for many years. It cost them $5 million to get their license. And the only person that could get a medical card in the state of New York had to have literally a, um, an illness that was going to take their life. That was the only, the only medical patients in the state of New York. And so they were waiting for chronic pain and for PTSD and some of these other ailments to hit the list. Um, they, they made great strides and we think New York will, will eventually go red, but back in 2012, um, after their hemorrhaging dollars, um, and their, for example, our vape pen in California would cost $40, the exact same vape pen, the same amount of cannabis, would be over $200 in the state of New York, not covered by insurance. And these are terminally ill people trying to get medicine. In the very beginning when we went multi-state, it was because our CEO saw brownies in Ziploc bags with Sharpie written on the bags and said, this is medicine for sick people. We can't have it like this. Mm -hmm. Bang had a nutritional fact panel on the very first product we ever launched. We had Lloyds of London product viability insurance in 2010. So he really saw it as his mission to take this cannabis that had a dosage that you could count on. We knew that if you broke our bar apart into 10 different segments, you were getting 10 milligrams. That was 10 years ago. Some, some edible companies are still struggling with dosing. Um, so, you know, having a chef at the helm really made and being a chemi, you get that. It's not that simple um, to have end to end in the same bar. It's very, there are some cannabis products on on the shelves right now where if you break it apart and you eat this side of the bar, you might get 10 milligrams. And if you eat this side of the bar, you might get 25 and that's gonna be a completely different experience. <laughs> and if you're trying to medicate sleep or um, use it for, for function, yeah, function or use it for chemotherapy or whatever it is, you really wanna have dosing be consistent. So the multi-state operator piece was more of a calling than a commercial um, enterprise, I will say. And also because people were coming to California to buy cannabis, were trying bang bars, and then would contact our company and say, how do I, get, can, can you just mail them to me? We're like, actually, no, it's federally illegal and we'll yeah. go to jail. So we still get people that ask us, please, will you just mail me a case of your bars to Idaho? I'm like, no. <laughs> but um, that's, that's really why we went multi-state. Um, the, the European and the South American and the Asian markets that we're currently serving, we're doing that only with CBD um, because we are manufacturing the CBD products here and then um, we, are, we are not exporting them. We have distributors that are importing them and that is a very distinct, um, di big distinction, so. Great, so did you, um, you know, with the, the banking issues, access to financial services that people have here in California and the United States, did you experience similar issues? other countries we haven't we haven't experienced those issues in other countries because the way our business model works um, by the time we expanded into Europe we've gotten pretty good at figuring out how to um, anticipate what the problems are going to be and set the business up to really achieve our goals um, but to give you an example we just had our credit card processing shut down five weeks ago and we you know, everyone is going to have to clap for me today because it's a big day for me. We just got our credit card processing back in two days. Um, five weeks we went dark. Um, and that's a big deal. We lost a lot of revenue. But we just had, what we found out was um, Elevon was the credit card processor. We were with 125,000 other CBD companies that got shut down overnight. And uh, U.S. Bank had been underwriting that. They did an internal surprise audit and found several people were selling cannabis on their hemp platform and shut everybody down. They said, no questions asked. We're not gonna go customer by customer and figure out who's doing it right. We're not gonna risk our bank charter. They just shut it all down. And then everybody's scrambling. So we just got our, our processing back up. It's, it'll take us a couple days to get to go live again. But yeah, banking's hurting us because customers had been going on we had a subscription service. People were ordering it, getting their, their meds sent to them. People are using these meds for all kinds of things, which we don't make medical claims, but I have customers saying, I can't sleep, or I can't function, or your CBD controls my anxiety, or whatever it is, 
and then they go on and our processing shut down and then they go to other places they also have processing shut down and it's just for the american people and for people around the world is it's asinine great thank you so bila i know you're not multi-state or yeah. country yet someday in the near future hopefully Actually, I'm, I'm trying to get there um it's crazy because like in the marijuana business as a rapper you got instagram and all these social media outputs uh, platforms that call you hey how can i get my product over here how can i get my product over here or your product um and it's really a tricky business because you have to really like if you're trying to get in another state besides california you kind of got to do a licensing deal mm -hmm. with somebody's down there and they they have regulations to where the marijuana that's that they're actually serving or the people get to has to come from that area. Everybody kind of want to protect their zone, like it has to be Michigan grown or whatever state it come from. So in order for you to be multiple state like that, you kind of got to do a license deal with somebody in that area and um, you know trust them on the business line and see, actually go down there and pick the product that you want to represent as being your brand. Yeah. And um, it can get tricky, like she said, but, um, you know, that's what happens all the time. And, yes, you get those, uh, can you just mail it to me? Do you know Trick Trick in Michigan? Yes, that's my guy. Is he? Okay. Yeah, that's my guy, Trick Trick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He got a love, too. Yeah, it's yeah. tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So with the, 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 the hemp and the CBD, I mean, uh, you know, the guys from here in California, like California really, like, kind of sets it off when it comes to this marijuana with the strains and all the different kind of ways of infusing it and then the world kind of follows the patterns behind that. So um, we, we, we like the innovators of it. So we start off the package and they see we do it and they want to do it. Um, and like you said, again, with the dosages, uh, you might have somebody, I had a, a customer come to my shop one time and she wanted some edibles, she was an elder delay. And this was before all the regulations, what the dosages had came about. And then she bought some edibles and she left. And she came back the next day and she threw the edibles at me. And I'm like, what's wrong? She, she said, like, basically it was too strong for her. It was a comparison because of the dosages, they don't know how to and it was like a thousand milliliters, right. thousand milligrams. Right. Right. So she thought I <laughs> tried to do something to her. So, you know, and if you a person that's trying to get introduced to marijuana in that type of form, and it's too much on your first try, it'll turn you all the way away from it. It's not even open it to it to even try to medicate from it because it was too strong. But what what you got, how you can uh, divide it evenly across the bar, is what the industry needed. But you said you had it 10 years ago. We did. See? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now what they do with the CBD, um, I guess they're infusing it with different flavors and different strains out here. And that's across the board. You can mm -hmm. you can travel with that. You're yeah. not going to jail, traveling with CBD marijuana. Mm -hmm. And um, CBD is just, it's taking off. I can't even keep up with it right now. It's, it's taking off worldwide. And, uh, and they even smoking it now. They're calling it uh, smokable hemp. Yeah. yeah. So CBD is, is key. Sounds like you need different levels of products, like the new, the advanced, somewhere in between, well, they, so yeah. they know what to buy. <laughs> well, yeah, well, they have different levels. They have what they call out here in California exotics, which is the highest of the highest. It's not your uh, average things that you can find in the supermarket or whatever. It's just some something that people made up in the three-bedroom house. And, <laughs> and with it. not sharing it with everybody. But this is what makes uh, these brands take off because they have something to offer that nobody else has. Not like the, you go get a company and you look at their strains and all their strains is the same as this company and this company and it's, it's like, okay, well, it's nothing special. But when you have like this exotic stuff, and then you got a lower level you know, so everybody don't want to get high. Everybody, some people just want to really medicate, and just cool out. So you got to know your different uh, strains, sativas, uh, indicas, and hybrids. What they do and the different effects they put on you, and um, you know, roll with it like that. All right, great, thank you. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about 
money fundraising. And before we get to your very exciting recent IPO, um, I had a couple questions for you. So you bootstrapped through the first couple years of your business, and then you started um, fundraising. So I wanted to ask you, how did you determine when to fundraise, and how did you go about doing that for some of the younger companies? When I ran out of money. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Don't tell anyone I said that, okay? <laughs> no, um, okay, so it takes a lot of money to run a cannabis company with regulations, <coughs> compliance, 280E, the tax code. And so we were fortunate to launch in 215 mode where we could have a collective and had a much lower barrier to entry. And what I tell every new entrepreneur is to create a minimum viable product to make sure that their business model works and the customers are there and there's real value there and people will buy it. And so we were fortunate that we got to do that under Prop 215. So we bootstrapped the business to start. We were really thoughtful and strategic about where we got licensed, how we got licensed, what rent we paid, all the way, um, not for lack of hard work. Like we earned every piece of that through sweat and determination. Um, nobody did it for us, for sure. And then as we look at scaling our company, we realized that I was running into a team bandwidth where I really needed to up-level my team, to grow my team. And so we did our first fundraise. We started. I started building the company in, in middle of 2016. We launched in the fall of 2016, and we started. We did our first fundraise last summer. So summer of 2018, um, we went out. And we we found two kind of early adopters of our products, family offices here in San Francisco, and we did our first initial investment round with them. Now we're doing a more traditional seed round. Um, and then seed round potentially Series A. Um, we have some interest in larger, the larger raise. So it's kind of a complicated. I mean, Jamie knows a lot more about actually going public, but even raising money, finding strategic investors, finding the right deals, finding legal deals. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunities that I've been presented with that are illegal. So they're not registered broker dealers. Um, I was presented a term sheet where included in the fifth page on the bottom was global exclusive rights for garden society worldwide outside of California. Right? And I was like, oh, well, well, excuse me, I read this. And so people, there's a lot of bad actors, There's it's very difficult to access the capital, and so you have to be really thoughtful and disciplined in reviewing it. And also, it, again, fundraising is just hard work at the end of the day, finding the right investors. Um, the fortunate thing, I think, from when Jamie started or from when, when you started out of the end, there's a lot more capital going into the market today than there was even three years ago. So there's a lot more options on the table, but there's also a lot more expectations that come with that around what's your top line trajectory, what's your profitability or your path to profitability, et cetera. So it's been quite the journey. I'm proud to say that we're, we're on the path to getting it done. So we have a lot of momentum going with this round, which is great. Um, but it is, you know, something that I think fundraise before you need it. If you're a smaller company and you're new, um, look ahead, really realistically project your cash flow needs. I didn't realize how much money it would take to grow at first last year. Um, the more success you have, the more money you need. It's kind of a double standard. Um, so I would say really own that cash flow model and then start fundraising six months before you actually think you need to fundraise because it takes that long to actually do it, no matter how good you are. Right, thank you. So that was actually the next question I was going to ask, which other than starting early, is there any other advice that you would give a early company that has not started fundraising yet on how to start fundraising? Yeah, the one thing we try to do a lot is peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. So find other companies who are, have done it, have, are doing it, um, ask questions, find an advisor if you don't know how to read term sheets. Um, we've been able to save a lot of money because we have really great advisors. So our legal office, you know, is, we don't work with you guys, but um, yeah. they're expensive. Uh, it's not yet, yeah. but they're expensive. <laughs> they have them review everything. So like, where can you, yeah. if you're a small business, where can you cut corners by getting strategic advisors yeah. to help guide? To, of course you need your legal office to do the final review and to create that term sheet but I think there's ways you can hack it more efficiently to move it forward and then um, at the end of the day like our, your network so like Sam here in the front row has made wonderful introductions for me I have another couple of women entrepreneurs that we swap war stories with we also trade bad investor names with like dude this guy's an asshole like watch out for him because 
because it's a very small community and you need to support each other and it's very hard, especially as a female in the space, it's very, very hard. And so um, I think the biggest thing for getting started is to ask for help and people will help you. Thank you so much. So now Jamie, mm -hmm. congratulations mm -hmm. on your IPO. Thank you, it was an RTO actually. Just Oh, of course, we just called him in. Hello. Hey, how you guys Sorry about this, Joe um, from Kaleva, he's the CMO, has just arrived, so um, he's just joining the panel Sorry. now. That's Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Joe from Kaleva, and I'm late. Traffic's really serious here in San Francisco. It's great to meet you all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So right now we're talking so. about fundraising, and we're going to hear from Jamie on why they decided to go public and what your experience was with that, and kind of like, what you thought about your valuation, how valuations are being done, if you want to give us some information on that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, first, I would want to say that I'm glad you're recording this, because I want to take what Aaron just said and have it somewhere accessible to new people going into the marketplace, because it was all really good advice. We, um, we tried four different companies. It took us it took us a couple of years. I'll say this, we started by bootstrapping also, and we did all of it on our own and just kept reinvesting uh, money that we were making into the business. And companies kept approaching us saying, we wanna take you public, you guys have the stuff, we're gonna take you, it's gonna be amazing. And then we take them a little bit down the road and find out what Aaron said. You, know, find, you have to read the fine print. Well, I came out of real estate, I did real estate investing for 20 years. I read contracts, I read them, and I understand them. And that's the key, you have to do, I always say write your divorce before you get married. If you're gonna get into the deal, you have to write your exit. It's, it's, it's the best advice, I would, and the other thing I would say is bad news doesn't get better with time. So if there's, if there's something in the deal that doesn't smell right, there's probably something stinky in the deal. So, um, I came at everything we did in cannabis with that sort of training. So when people were coming to us and saying, we've got money for you, I was immediately skeptical because the reality was the people that I knew that had money that I approached and said, I've got this great deal, I've got this great company, were like, ooh, cannabis, we're not really, we don't have an appetite for that right now. Um, things are different today than they were last year, the year before. Four years ago, forget it. Nobody <coughs> wanted to give, nobody, family offices, investment banks, nobody was trying to put money in cannabis. There were some risk takers out there that blazed a trail and, you know, we have to all thank them for, you know, pouring funds into the, into the world. And there's a lot of Canadian money right now in cannabis, but we're starting to see things shift. We're seeing money come from elsewhere. Yes. Um, so, so with that said, we went the RTO route because there really isn't access um, to the capital that we needed. Like Aaron said, when you're successful, you need more money to expand. And you know, it's like that UPS commercial where the orders were coming in and we're all really excited. And then it was like, and we're like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna keep up? And you really do need capital to keep up. So the RTO was um, challenging. It was a learning experience and it, it's giving us access to the capital we need to expand globally because we are expanding globally. We had already made some of those deals and some of those changes that are pretty capital intensive. Your question about valuations, I get that question a lot. Um, valuations is tricky. There's, you know, investors use multipliers and in, re in real estate, I equate it to what they call cap rate, which I call crap rate because I don't invest in real estate based on a pro forma number, which is basically, it's, it's a big guess and wishful thinking. I want to see numbers. I want to know what my cogs are, what my price is, what my supply chain is. It's basic business. But what happens, you have investors come to the table and they think you're all a bunch of stoners. So they don't treat you or, or approach you as though you have this business acumen that all of us in our industry, or, or I should say in our company, we all came with, with a lot of business experience. So to have people talk to you like you're stupid or 
you know, just discount you or try to just take you to the cleaners uh, or bend you over or slide some, you know, snake oil salesman clause into your contract. You just do this over and over and over again. When we started running into people who were serious about investing, who knew what they were talking about and saw the opportunity of what Bang was or what some of these other companies are, it, it became fun again. First it was just challenging, now it's just fun. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. So before we move on to the next topic, Isaac, did you want to add anything to fundra about fundraising? Sure. So I started the master roots with my best friend in his college dorm room. Uh, we were smoking hitting the bong, and uh, we thought, you know, there needs to be a tech platform uh, for cannabis. Um, so I ended up investing all my life savings, maxing out all my credit cards, $17,000 at the time, to get the company off the ground. Um, we were then able to start raising a seed round with the help of the ArcView Group, which is a great angel network out there, for those of you um, who are familiar with it. And then we took the company public. Um, we were actually one of the first cannabis companies to go public through an S1 registration statement. So the traditional way of going public, filing your audit financials, business plan with the SEC. Um, we started trading in 2015 under the ticker symbol MSRT. And uh, I think we've now raised 15 different rounds of capital, about $37 million. Um, we have about 35,000 shareholders on the open market, and uh, it's been quite a journey. And I echo all the sentiments shared here. Um, you know, investors are often trying to sneak things into, into docs, and they can come in various different forms and ways and means, um, which is why it's very important to have great legal counsel. We've been with Shepard Mullen for two years now. They're the best in business, have the best docs, and we always... Uh, have mandate that our council handles the docs so that way we always know what's in there. Um, and actually Shepard Mullen just recently helped me with a Series C enhanced voting shares. So um, it's a way that I as a founder um, know that I have enhanced voting rights such that um, I don't think it's possible and it would be very, very hard for any investor or any outside group to try to take control of the company. Um, away from the founding vision. And um, so I echo all these sentiments and just stress it's great to have good legal counsel there along the way. Thank you so much for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask him to do that, I swear. Okay, um, now we're going to move on to one of my favorite topics um, because I do trademark work, which is branding. And Joe, you came just in time for that. Um, so you were the CEO of a branding agency before you stepped into this business. So if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, stepping into this industry sure. recently and then what are some of the nuances with respect to branding in this industry sure. versus others? First of all, I want to carry a microphone everywhere I go from now on. It's really <laughs> powerful. Um, I come from the advertising side. I worked for a public group for years and then I had a company called Milk. We were based on it outside of New York City. We were a conventional advertising agency specializing in CPG. I spent most of my career in controlled substance, so I had a pretty good understanding of legality working for RJ Reynolds Tobacco and a few other companies. Um, I was really passionate about the industry. We had the opportunity about four years ago to do some like spade work uh, with Privateer when they did the Marley Natural acquisition. So for me, that was like our first toe in the water. I own the company Milk, and we kind of went in with both feet. Um, we thought we'd be an unfair advantage because we really know Marketing and advertising, what a refresh. So that was like three and a half years ago. We then launched our own product called Yup, which is an edible. Uh, we started selling it in Oregon. Um, and it kind of went okay. I had the experience everyone else probably did with being an entrepreneur and, and plunking along. We never raised money. We spent our own money doing it. Um, but uh, it was fraught with a lot of issues, like everybody has. One is <clears throat> how do consumers adapt and adopt a brand in a category that is specifically catered towards something that's more backwoods or you just know a guy who knows a guy. So how do you make a transition to being a consumer package good? That was the first thing that we kind of uh, you know embraced and figured out. Second thing was the sales organizations that we were talking to didn't really understand channel marketing or any of the conventional stuff from the CPG side. And forgive me if I get kind of boring on this. Um, but eventually what we learned, we found the right path to sell. Um, but that led me ultimately to meeting Dennis O'Malley, who was our CEO 
and that was a little while back, uh, and then I took a job and actually pushed away my equity in, in milk and took the job at CMO uh, at Kaliba about a month and a half ago. Really exciting. Um, that doesn't answer any of your questions. <laughs> but I saw that. Great. Really soon, because I'm flying back to New York. I have a meeting tomorrow morning in New York. Okay. But the thing that's been really exciting is being part of like what I think is the last unplowed field, right? And as a CPG guy, what I always care about, and having worked on Coke and Pepsi and pretty much in Starbucks and everything there is, there are very few fields that are unplowed from a branding perspective. And that's what makes me excited as a marketer, because the chance is right. You have a mature audience, they're an intelligent audience. It's an evolving audience really quickly. Um, and it's kind of the only show that's left, you know, as far as a C from a CPG model anyway. That's, okay, great. Yeah. Before we pass to anybody else that you have to leave, is there anything public that you can share with us about your very exciting partnership with Jay-Z? Um, uh, not really, other than I can tell you that he sought us out, which we're really excited about. You know, he looked throughout the category and he looked for a company that he felt aligned with his like values and who he is. Uh, as an artist, I don't assume to know uh, Mr. Carter, uh, but he reached out to us and then um, we struck a, a JV with him and we're very excited to be working with him. Um, you know, that's probably the most I can say about it at this point, but oh. we're pretty excited. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you want to say before you have to go? Do you have any comments on fundraising? Have you guys raised seventy-five million? Recently? Yeah, we in, in January we we, okay. we were overfunded at seventy-five million. It was great. Um, you know, it's great to be part of an organization that's going up. Um, we've probably all been in places that are going up and going down. This is definitely a category that's going up and an organization that's going up, and that's a hell of an awesome ride to be part of. You know, Carol Bartz is our is our is our chair on our board, and she's great. Uh, you know, guiding vision. Dennis is our CEO. He's a hell of a good guy and insanely smart. Um, you know, we're, we were fortunate, I think, in that capital raise. Um, we've been very quietly doing our own thing, which is kind of different from a lot of other groups, I think. If you look at an acreage or something like that, they're very public about what they're doing. What I loved about Kaliba was they kept the kimono really closed and they just kind of did the right thing, you know, over and over again, um, kind of in a stalwart way, which was really important to me too. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so back to branding, I wanted to hear from Bila a little bit, if you could tell us about your brand and how you came up with it and what you've done with it so far. Okay, so my brand is called Bila, which is short for Be Legit. And how I got my name, uh, well, I got my name from high school, but um, actually, in 1996, I had an album come out um, called The Ant Museum, and it had a long extended blunt on there about this long. And this this blunt came about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from college, you know, being in the dorm room on the weekends. And, um, you know, as teenagers, you smoke in the little small joints and you pass it. And it never makes it back to you. <laughs> never makes it back. So I decided uh, I'm going to put two or three of them together. And this is just, you know, being a kid in college and rolling like that. That way you can make it around rotation. So um, when I got back from college and got back to California, I started doing it out here. And I actually put one on the album cover. So everybody just started rolling them and called them Beelers. Be legit. Beelers. That's what they call them. So, uh, fast forward to when marijuana started being, you know, legal. I said it would only be right if I, you know, make a, another one and sell it, you know, at the, in the cannabis uh, store. But I actually made a small one first before I made the long one. But um, so I, I put that together. And I, it came out good. I test marketed at the shop. Um, it started flying off the shelf. So I was like, okay. I'm going to go ahead and take it a little further with this and I'm going to do the, the whole branding thing, not just with the beat of once, but with the, you know, marijuana too. And um, it, does, it does well. So now I'm looking into the licensing for different states because it's a growing industry. And now, they, you know, if you set it up properly with the licensing, you can get your product in different states besides California. So that's kind of how that came about with me. The good thing about it is that I'm a rapper, and 
I can do all my own advertising. And so, <laughs> yeah. so he kind of gives us an advantage, like he has an advantage of uh, being a brand and expert. But, you know, we, we uh, artists is brand too, so, and it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. All right. And where's your shop? It's in Vallejo, California, 3201 Snow Boulevard. If you guys are in Vallejo, stop by. It's called the Hip Hop Station. It's kind of where music meets marijuana. So. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Great. And right now, is that the only place to buy a product? Oh, no. It's, uh, it's uh, out here in San Francisco, Green Door, uh, uh, Barbie Coast, a lot of different places, Gary. You know, uh, it's real, real popular. All right, so come see him after if you're interested. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Chris, um, I wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit about the legal issues that um, your day and your clients oh, are thing. dealing with in the space with respect to the regulatory issues and labeling, right. and if you have any advice for um, how to mitigate this. Right. Well, hi, everyone. So, I'm, I mentioned before I'm a new partner here at Shepherd Mullen, but I had a similar story that I think many of our, us in the group. Yasmin, where um, I backed into the industry, I was at another firm uh, and uh, counseling vape companies. So to answer your question directly, you can imagine vaping is going to get to be a smaller industry soon because of FDA regulation. So many of them are moving into cannabis as fast as they can. So for example, we just pitched a vape client that's moving into CBD and cannabis. They're going to keep their businesses separate. CBD in some ways is a very different product. As I think many of you already know, then cannabis, and by cannabis I mean THC above the federal levels, 0.3% by the way. And um, we had there in the room for the pitch a tax lawyer, corporate lawyer, intellectual property. Um, I do regulatory, so I'll do uh, uh, labeling reviews. That comes right out of my food background. Uh, when I'm in a grocery store, I can never leave because I'm always looking at labels. It's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a weird, just to give you one example, it's a weird world. California, very early on, exempted CBD from its marijuana laws. So if someone says, hey, Chris, I'm going to have a CBD product, give me a labeling review. You know, I, I'll look at it, but there really isn't any guidance to that, as opposed to, say, Indiana. And I've advised clients in Indiana, which has really, imagine of all places in Indiana, uh, you know, became legit. Right. on CBD <laughs> and um, so those are just and then uh, they're the multi-state agreements are big where you're you have co-manufacturers in each state so the question is many states are like California where the state is trying to uh, control each stage of the supply chain so if you just have an agreement with a manufacturer in Nevada is that okay or do you need to register in Nevada so we're looking and then state after state so we're looking at all that. So as many of you have probably discovered, one of the mitigation risks is first find out what you're doing is illegal. Uh, and I, I can help on that. You know, have you all heard of epiodolex? Mm -hmm. Probably not pronouncing it. It is a cannabis drug approved by FDA for kids of all, of all things. And yet it's still Schedule 1. So give me a break. And, um, and, and for years, Congress would pass these budget acts that said you can't enforce the marijuana laws. Control Substances Act against companies that are otherwise fully compliant initially with state medical <coughs> marijuana laws. So I ask you, if you're fully compliant with California's medical marijuana law of a couple years back, were you violating federal law? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but we can help companies try to mitigate that risk, keeping your businesses separate because of the 280E, <coughs> obviously. Recognizing that CBD and cannabis, the THC, have different risk exposures. Uh, do it state by state. Keep your keep everything in state. I've heard uh, with your supply chain. Uh, when the hemp became legal under the federal laws, that obviously removed an element of a liability. But you know, I strongly encourage everyone to really question: Are they really getting uh, what they're asking for? And food, I know for many years, a lot of your food is baked. So good luck finding authentic extra virgin olive oil. But that's another discussion. <laughs> and so from that, I moved in there. And FDA sent out, the FDA, uh, I think a lot of cannabis is, uh, is going to be FDA because of the edibles, because of, uh, you know, cosmetics, because of, uh, you know, the tinctures is a dietary supplement. So, um, you know, it's, we, we live in a, a, you know, a changing world where it's not clear to me at all that what you're doing is illegal and 
if maybe there's a gray area, you know, we can help you uh, try to work around that. I think vaping is very interesting. Um, normally, FDA can't regulate vapes unless there's nicotine in it. But if your CBD in it, is that illegal? You know, where does it come from? Uh, the FDA, I was mentioning the FDA warning letters. You probably heard of one today. Uh, obviously, I'm not giving legal why I say, please don't make medical claims ever. Or you're, you fire your CMO because everyone looking for CBD knows that they have, they bring to it some notion of what they want. So if you have to explain it to your audience, I think you've got the wrong audience. Mm -hmm. And you know, FDA is looking at kids, they're looking at people making medical claims, and they're looking at quote, fake CBD. A lot of the products they tested that were making these claims, even somewhat innocuous claims, they found out there isn't any CBD in them, or, or very little. So that, I think that would be kind of the, you know, that's how we kind of uh, this company. So it's all over the map, as you can imagine. So for those who are not aware, you're referring to the warning um, warning letters about making things like, our product's going to cure that's Alzheimer's. Right, <laughs> exactly. Like that. So yeah. who, who got a letter today? Purely. Uh, purely. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. You can tell I've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't been on my it, phone. It, it happens every day. You know, and um, and also, you know, uh, having cannabis and foods, you can't put anything in food unless it's FDA approved. Yeah. It doesn't matter how legal. So as soon as the Congress wakes up tomorrow and totally legalizes cannabis, that doesn't mean you can put it in food legally. Yeah. Well, it says though that as an edible producer, right. Right. cannabis, food containing cannabis is not food. Right. Per the state no. statute. So right. the way edible right. makers state get around statute. it right. is that we're not a right. food. So right. we're therefore not regulated with you. Right, that's state. Uh, True. Yeah, F FDA is a different, but clearly FDA doesn't want to move against edibles or vaping or anything because they're looking at what the substance really is. They don't really know. And there's a, I don't know if you heard, there's a big hearing May 31st for the FDA. And basically the takeaway is, takeaway was, we don't know what full spectrum and broad, broad spectrum hemp is. There's a lot of confusion. We don't understand their substance. There's a lot of promise. We want to study it. We want to move quickly. So. Just to say, and uh, you know, the California Department of Public Health came out and said um, something mysterious was back in June, I think, of last year. And they said, we can't really have cannabis and food. Well, now there's a bill, uh, AB 228, if I remember correctly, and I think they're going to change that. A lot that. of no's. All right. Yeah. Is here, a regulatory expert. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, there's, there's a, whether something's legal or not, be curious. And, and if it's a little bit great, maybe there are ways to mitigate your risk that will pay off big time later. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I wanted to comment on that. Um, what I what I see happening at Bang is, you know, the market speaks. So for example, we got completely shut down um, selling cannabis or CBD chocolate, excuse me, in California. And then all of a sudden we had big um, distribution companies call us and say, oh, we think 228 is gonna pass, we're gonna place an order. And so you, you, you see companies have their ear to the legislative ground uh, really blazing the trail. So that's good. Right. Okay, great. Um, so now I'm, I want to make sure we have time um, for the next topic, which is for you two. And um, so I wanted to talk about being badass females in the space. And um, we'll start with you, Erin. If you could tell us a little bit about what's it like to be a female and not only a male dominated industry, but also a stigmatized industry. Yeah, sure. Um, it's definitely challenging, but definitely rewarding. I think we were talking about this even before in the lobby. Um, you know, as a chemical engineer, I was one of the few women in my program. I went to work for a German CPG company where, again, was the first female that had built me a locker room. Um, just trying to get your attention. Um, I was the first woman in the executive branch, so I'm used to being alone. Um, and so what drew me to cannabis were the women, honestly. Yeah. So it's a female plant. I found a community of people. I was helping people like myself. I found women that I could work with. Um, but what you see with the regulations changing into the new regulated economy here in California specifically is a significant decrease in the number of women in the space. So what we really try to do is walk the walk in providing, uh, whether it's business, business transactions, business opportunities, and supply chain. So like we work with women in everywhere we can, um, whether it's mentoring peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's, you know, advising other companies, whether it's... Um, helping people figure out how to fundraise for their company, 
But unless consumers and businesses specifically are intentional about creating an ecosystem of diversity and equity within the space, capital is going to come in and it's going to look like every other industry in the space. Look at big tech, look at big CPG. It's going to be white corporate venture capital money. And it's so much easier to raise money as a person that looks like that space. And so as a woman, like, how do you actually create this new ecosystem for what we all want it to be? We all want diversity. We all want craft. We all want the OGs. We all want equity. And so how do we use our platforms as already in the space to amplify that and ensure that we can do everything possible to create that moving forward? Great. Well, we got an OG right here. Okay, I love but, it. Um, <laughs> but, so thank you very much for that. Um, Jamie, can you tell us about being a C-level executive in the space as well? Sure. Um, I came out of high school as a basketball player. I played high school basketball, then I played um, college basketball. I was on the USA team. And so I really grew up my whole life on teams of strong women. And it's a really comfortable place for me. So when I'm looking for um, executives to multitask, because right now um, we're backfilling in infrastructure. So it requires people to wear many hats. And if I'm going to give something um, to a busy woman, I know it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and not to be flippant, but it's just a comfortable place for me. Um, and also I've been a leader in all of those teams. I was the captain of every basketball team I was on was a point guard, and that's the, the coach on the floor. So it's just kind of who I am as a person. And then when I was in the real estate industry, uh, it was male dominated, you know, investing in real estate, raising capital, doing deals, sitting across the table from mostly white men. I had to learn how to talk the talk, walk the walk. And I'm not, um, you know, villainizing anybody. It just was my reality. So I'm comfortable in those circumstances. But I was also very deliberate in the choices that I made in my real estate company to hire women, to hire people of color, because those are things that I believe in and that's what we're doing at Bang as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, so Vila um, and Isaac, I wanted to ask you, what are your plans and next steps? We'll start with Vila. Like, where would you like to see your company or your cannabis business go next? Well, um, like they say, and um, you guys was talking about earlier, is, is um, if they open it up, making it a more of a worldwide situation, a global situation, I would like to see that happen for me, for sure on that aspect. But um, I'm noticing that, like, I feel like a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people are coming, so to speak, out the closet, mm -hmm. like they really want to be part of this industry, they want to work in this industry, and they want to know more about it, like these kind of events and stuff like that is happening. Um, and I'm, you, you got me up here talking about this stuff now. So um, I think it's important for the culture and everybody to, you know, to, to open this dialogue up and talk about it in that way that the whole industry can grow and people won't have to feel ashamed about, you know, all, you know, feeling like they're doing something big. But yeah, just to make it a global thing, um, that's what I'd like to see, you know. Thank you. Well, over the next five years, I will probably lose the rest of my hair because it's a very stressful, <laughs> very stressful industry, a very stressful time. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we really want to be a leading cannabis app out there. But if you think of many other industries like Uber for transportation or Expedia for travel, there's usually an app that dominates a particular category. And right now we feel that's undefined for marijuana. And if we can be the leading marijuana app where consumers can earn rewards, can find the best products, can connect with other consumers who are looking to solve the same ailments, we feel that that is a hundred million, potentially billion dollar opportunity that's right for the taking. Um, that's what we would like Masters to be. Thank you. And do you, do you want to add on upcoming projects that you want to talk about? Well, one of the things I wanted to add before I forget um, is we have a CBD brokerage at Bang. We've been selling CBD since 2011, and if you trace the, the really the beginnings of the CBD uh, explosion in the United States, we imported a million dollars worth of CBD in 2011, so that was eight years ago, and nobody was talking about CBD back then. 
our first CBD chocolate bar won an award in 2011. So what I want, the reason I want to put that out there is um, we saw CBD as what it was going to be now. What we started three years ago was our terpene line. And I wanted to just mention that because if you in the audience, just show of hands, how many of you feel really comfortable talking about terpenes? What do you tell us what those are? So terpenes are basically I'm smells. I'm going to um, simplify this, but they're basically smells. Um, if you if you take the terpene limonene, for example, you can extract the smell of lemons from a lemon, or you can extract limonene from lemon haze marijuana, and it's the same smell. It's limonene, it's a terpene. What we know about cannabis is that the really the indica sativa effect is dictated by the terpenes in the cannabis. So it is, um, you know, we know that sativa plants have a skinnier leaf and the indica plants have the fatter leaf, but what we also know is the effect of the cannabis is driven by the terpenes. So at Bang we say, THC makes you high. The terpene is what drives you either, um, as sativa has the Latin roots, you know, satellite up and um, indica, we always say into couch. I got that from my dad. <laughs> into couch. Um, so anyway, we have a lot of terpene products, and the thing about terpenes are they're not federally regulated. So I can put a cannabis terpene infused chocolate bar, beverage, anything on the shelf at Whole Foods, in Albertsons, Con Super. It doesn't matter because I can put infused with cannabis derived terpenes and have the word cannabis on a package and have, can have the lemon skunk terpene infusing that beverage, and I am not breaking the law, but I am providing you an effect. It's the same idea as if you give your baby a bath with lavender, because we know that lavender activates the relaxation part of your brain. It's a scent, it's aromatherapy. That is what a lot of the scents are doing in cannabis, is that smell, that skunky smell, those different smells, are, are part of your high. So I can give the can a curious a product that is not making them high with THC, but is giving them an effect. And that is what Bang sees as the next frontier. So that's where we're investing significant funds is in our terpene line. Great, thank you so much. Um, before we open it up to the audience for questions, I wanted to ask if any of you else had anything you wanted to say. Yeah. Is that the only one? Um, I'd like to just uh, close up the panel now and uh, give everyone a, a round of applause for incredible panel. Thank you.